The current path that I think humanity is on, and I wrote this down like 2016, automation will take away most jobs. Once most jobs are automated, you got to have universal basic income from a pure political perspective because you don't want riots in the streets. You're going to pay people for existing, essentially. So you got to give them a way to find meaning, right? Then that's where the metaverse comes in. And, you know, most people will probably live in virtual reality. That's going to become the frog of choice, so to say. But the core part here is that the metaverse should be decentralized because it gets very, very scary when like a centralized company owns it, right? Thank you very much everybody for coming and, and joining us. I was so thrilled to hear that Felix will be in town. We know each other for over a year yeah. and only met in the metaverse. <laughs> so he came into town, I called up Thomas and I know it's super last minute but we have to take the opportunity to oh. you know, have everybody come and join and, and listen to, to Felix. I put a lot of pressure on Felix and said, you know, the YPO crowd really is looking for insights. They cannot get anywhere else. And you can share without any worries of reassurance that this will not leave the room. So I just want to remind everybody that this event runs under form confidentiality rules. I've been a futurist my whole life. When I was eight years old, I would like build robots. When I was 12, I would study uh, AI through like, you know, Ray Kurzweil's works, you know, like the similarities near the age of spiritual machines and so forth. And, you know, around like 2012, I've realized one of the best ways to deploy that passion and that skill set is through investing and tra trading. And so I've always been like investing in future technologies. And so in 2015, 16, I fell down the crypto rabbit hole, started one of the first crypto hedge funds so that's been going on for five years now, uh, which also I connect with FISA. And in 2020, I realized that the metaverse is probably one of the biggest opportunities of the next 10 years, which we'll discuss, you know, because it's this perfect storm of Web3, AI, virtual reality, augmented reality. Um, and really this next phase of the digital world, which we've been living through in the last 10 years, where we went from, a, even when I was a kid, you know, an analog world playing outside. And now it's, we're spending more than half our waking hours in the digital world, right? And so we've been focusing entirely on that for like the last two years now with the Metaverse Fund, but also, you know, crypto for like six, six years now. And so i uh, excited to like dive more into that um, tonight. So like dial it back first, um, you know, I, I prepared a presentation, but I can do it purely verbally. I think the most important first thing to kind of wrap your head around is what the metaverse even means. We, we already have the internet, right? Um, and the way I would frame it is that the metaverse itself, to use a normal, normal term, is the digitally native world. Okay, now what does, that, what does it mean, right? Native meaning that it can stand on its own legs, meaning that it's not an, an adjacent tool. It's not just uh, something that enhances our physical experience, but rather it is a digital experience in and of itself. And especially when you look at your kids, um, you know, there, there's been an in interesting kind of trend where back in the day, you know, kids would, let's say, like when I, when I was younger, you know, we would use Facebook, for example, to connect with our friends to say, hey, let's meet up at your house. Let's meet up at my house, right? It was a form of communication for the physical world. Today, they don't even meet in person, but rather they might rather say, you stay at your house, I stay at my house, and we play Fortnite. We play some game and their existence is completely in the digital world. And there's one question I always love to ask, which is, you know, how much time do you spend online, whether that's on your phone, on your computer, on any sort of device? And I think I've asked this question at this point over a thousand times because I've needed the net seminars and the average answer I get is about eight hours. And that's actually with millennials or older, Gen Z will probably be a higher number. The second question I then ask is, well, how many hours do you sleep a day? And they probably say seven or eight hours. Well, so there's 24 hours in a day. We sleep seven or eight. Let's keep it simple to eight. You spend eight online, which means you spend half your waking hours in the digital world. Now with Gen Z, it's probably more like 12 hours, which means now you're spending 75% of your waking hours in the digital world. And so now to bring it back to that term, the digitally native world, that means it's a world where we care just as much, if not more, about the digital reality than about the physical reality. And so I always love to like root it in like the present moment, right? Because we see Ready Player One and like those kind of things. It seems really, really far out. To me, Metaverse 1.0 is social media, gaming, TV shows, right? Social media already today, you know, I say people, like girls my age, they care more about what they wear on Instagram than what they wear when they leave the house. And they only care about what they wear when they leave the house because they want to take a picture so that then they can put it on Instagram, right? Funny enough, um, people couldn't wrap their head around like, why would somebody spend $100,000 to buy an NFT like a Bored Ape, right? Status. Well, ironically, uh, two weeks ago or so, Mark Zuckerberg, um, well, Elon, first it was Elon that introduced the verified check mark that for once you can pay for it, right? Zuckerberg now copied that system and said, you can now pay $15 a month to be verified on Instagram. 
Anybody guess how many people paid for that service? I think the number was about 450 million, which means Facebook added something to the tune of like $3 billion in revenue. Why? Right. And what is it? Digital status. People feel important, even though now they pay, you know, it's paid for, right? It used to mean status because you can only get it if you're like a notable person. Then they said, well, I want to be one of the first people now I'm notable too. And that is actually like how the first time like NFTs really clicked for me, like these Bored Apes, for example, because, well, I can buy a Lamborghini for, you know, a quarter million or $400,000 and I can impress my neighbors and I have to be really loud and obnoxious for them to notice that I have a Lamborghini. Meanwhile, I can make a Bored Ape or a CryptoPunk, my profile picture, and everybody on the internet can see, well, this guy must have a lot of money. He must be somebody. He's important, right? So that, that first era of NFTs was a lot of like, you know, social signaling, status and so forth. And why does it matter? Because this new generation cares more about the digitally native world than the physical world. They care more about that profile picture than the Lamborghini. They care more about like some of these other, like they come up with the likes than the Rolex, right? It's like that's that's the first migration which plays a lot a huge role even in understanding things like for example digital fashion because there will be huge change whether it's like digital fashion for example where well am i going to spend a lot of money um well let's put it the other way people will question why would i spend a lot of money buying a digital outfit well you don't even get the physical piece it's it was never about the physical piece it was about what that piece means Right, like the, 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 again, the this, this, this signaling, the rarity, how you look in it, right? And so, to you know, give a practical example, you know, one of the companies we backed, um, Dress X, um, they're the number one digital fashion startup in the world, where they've done partnerships with like you know Prada, uh, uh, Louis Vuitton, Balenciaga, you name it. Where I think it was actually Dolce & Gabbana that sold, I think, a, a, a digital dress for either one or two million dollars, and somebody actually bought it, right? Again. And the, the interesting thing now is this digital dress, you can wear it using augmented reality on your, on your profile. So for example, I, I can take a picture and it overlays it on me. Actually, where's my phone? You know, I have the app, right? So for example, let me I'll make Karina my um, model for the moment. Let's see, what are we gonna put on here? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't own that one. I don't know. Um, but so for example, you can, you can wear something using augmented reality uh, on Instagram. You could be on Zoom and overlay it on yourself while you're on the call. Um, you could, so I guess I have bad service in here. Uh, you can, uh, they've, they've done partnership with Roblox, for example, where they've sold, I think, over 200,000 items inside of Roblox where, you know, this is, that, that's like skins is not something new. People have all, like the skin market in like, video games has already been a multi-billion dollar industry, right? And again, why would a, a child, you know, pay dollars for how the avatar looks well because their friends care right because again like socially that's where people spend more and more of their time and so you know this is step one we know what is the metaverse it's a digital native world where we care just as much if not more about the digital reality than the physical reality and so then the question becomes you know how fast are we going to get there like you know how is it how is this evolving and there's really four core I guess technological shifts that are happening that are all now coming together as like this perfect storm where on one hand you have AI. I mean, it's that over the past, I think few months, it's been very hard to miss what's been going on with AI, um, whether it's like image generation, whether it's chat GPT, like language models. Um, and that's evolving really fast. Now we can dive into that. Then there is VR and AR, virtual reality and augmented reality where we've gone from these huge clunky headsets that you need to tether into your computer, running on a gaming computer, to now the latest, the Oculus Quest Pro, is about like this thin, right? It's much lighter, much smaller, higher processing power. And, you know, now Apple's also getting in the game, right? And the, the question is, you know, when was the last time Apple messed up a product launch, right? Apple was able to take the smartphone, which before we only had Blackberries, right? With, with little tiny buttons, made the, made the smartphone go mainstream. Apple took the tablet, which before you always had the stylus, very clunky, you know, that many people were using warehouses, made the tablet go mainstream. Then the smartwatch, you know, there was maybe Fitbits, right? And then Apple went to the smartwatch game, made the smartwatch go mainstream. And then there was uh, cordless headphones, right? People, and now you walk down the street, it's hard to not see somebody with the wide little AirPods in their heads, right? And so now the next product that's coming out in June is the mixed reality headset that Apple is bringing out. Right, and that's already a, a huge move forward, which again we can also like dive more into because we've built a really close relationship with Meta, for example, like what they're, how they're focusing, for example, on fitness actually, um, 
And then, so the first super trend, AI, second super trend, AR, VR. Third one is Web3, right? Because in the past, if you have a virtual world, it's always controlled by the game maker. Or really, it was only games, right? Now, all of a sudden, you can have a world that governs itself. You can use crypto technologies like, for example, decentralized autonomous organizations, DAOs, where every player can have a vote and say, hey, this is how this world works. Right? You can have an in-game economy that's powered by decentralized finance, by DeFi, where you know, you know, it, you don't just wake up and for example, world of uh, funny enough, mini, mini background story. The um, the founder of Ethereum was motivated. Does anybody know why the founder of Ethereum started Ethereum? Yeah. He was um, he was a big World of Warcraft player, and he had like a really w rare sword. And one day, World of Warcraft deleted his rare sword, and he got really upset because you know a centralized entity should never be able to destroy like his this 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 rare sword that he worked for, and so he created a decentralized system with, with Ethereum, right? And and so now you know with, with, whether it's decentralized finance, you can have fully flush markets for virtual world that again govern themselves, and now with NFTs, you can also prove providence, have you know rarity, and you know actually prove ownership and transfer ownership across different worlds, right? I might have an item in one world, sell it to somebody else, they now own it, they can, oh, I can, they can rent it out to somebody else and actually make money with it and it becomes an actual item versus just like a little UI entry that can disappear, that can, they can just mint more off, they, you know, where the, that, and that's happened many times where, um, you know, game developers, because they see I can make more money, let's just create more of this rare item and then the, the actual economy collapses. Funny enough, there was a, Amazon, when they launched the first massive multiplayer online game like two years ago or so, they had a buck in their economy. And I think within like the first week or so, there was hyperinflation and the whole like in-game economy collapsed, right? So like those things, those things do matter. But um, anyway, so the, to the super trends, you know, with, with Web3, DAOs, DeFi, NFTs, this has all happened in the last two years or so. And then the fourth and last one is actually gaming, where um, just recently, like after many years now, Unreal Engine 5 came out, and I've got a video that I can later show, where um, if you actually see what the graphics nowadays look like, it is insane. This is why the video I have is actually less than 12 hours old, where you would think it's a video. Like you would think somebody filmed something, but in reality, it's, it's a game. And so we've gotten to the point where the video games can now actually look like reality, where you can't even tell it. And so now if you stack all these together, it gets really really exciting because you know that's why i can like dive into each of them a, a little bit more um with ai for example we've come across companies tackling four different core things that really play into this one is uh creating like i guess i guess the core concept is creating scalable and ultra personalized content so for example you know i could type in hey create me a world that looks, um, um, you know, create, create a city that maybe looks like a Barcelona, but it could be in Game of Thrones, right? That has like a medieval hint to it, you know, but there's maybe uh, uh, relics from a future time, right? It can create that world for you, right? You can create AI generated worlds and maps. Then contextually, you could create non-player characters, and I have a video for that I could share later, share later too, non-player characters, NPCs, that you can have infinite conversations with, right? Like already now you can talk to ChatGPT, but now take that, move it onto a virtual character that's not real, right? And you can talk to them and they reply contextually to what you said to them without it, because in the past, a developer would have to sit there and say, okay, first, you know, there's four response, there's two responses you can give. Based on those two responses, he'll say this thing, right? It's a pure like logic flow. If you say A, response B happens. Then you've option a, uh, like DEF, and then you give one of them and then this happens. Yeah. You can forget all that, right? Now you can feed in lore, for example, like if we take the Game of Thrones example, you could feed in the seven books of Game of Thrones. Now it's got full context of what's going on in the world, right? And you say, maybe you, you say, okay, this guy's a farmer. So now you will take the vantage point of a farmer inside of Game of Thrones based on all the contextual knowledge and add in your input. So you can say whatever you want to that farmer and based on the context and on his position in that world, he will respond to you. And that becomes really fascinating. I had a call with um, Adam Draper from Boost VC where we discussed, you know, currently in, in virtual reality, it's one, me one human, one human, right? Like I'm in, a, in VR chat, for example, and I talk to somebody and they talk to me. And the future is probably going to be this where you could say it's scary. One human, a million AI, 
right? I could go to the virtual bar and chat up a girl, but in reality, maybe she's just a projection, you know, of my Facebook data, right? Right? Because like Facebook owns Oculus, right? Right? She's perfect because like they already have 10 years of my history, right? They know exactly what pictures I liked on Instagram. So they know what, it, what, what it girls, girls are like, that what they look like. And maybe they see what Facebook groups I'm part of. So they know what interests I'm affiliated with. Maybe they've, you know, read my tweets. So they know what political uh, association I have. And boom, now you can create infinite amounts of virtual characters that I can have infinite conversations with. And it is going to be uh, like, just like Turing tests, very hard for me to tell, is this actually a real person or is this not a real person, All right? Very powerful for the game developer. Of course, that's where there's gonna be a lot of like ethical conversations because technically um, you can use that to groom people of all ages. For example, if you say, hey, this person is currently Republican or like this guy, this person is centrist, but leading Republican, let's turn him Democrat, right? By for example, let that girl at the bar keep, says a lot of things and because we are the average of the five people closest to us, right? If we hear enough certain logic points that we they know would speak to us, you can slowly change somebody, yes. right? Um, okay, you see that in marriages. Right. We have seen in the past, right? And, and, and the thing is, again, it, if you said this two years ago, you'd think, oh, this is really, really far away, but now with ChatGPT, it's becoming much, much closer. The third one is, you know, AI generated content, like for example, like in-game items. And there's already like, you know, many portfolio companies, I've got another video where you could say, for example, hey, create um, a weapon skin that look, I have a video that's like a weapon skin that looks like um, Hello Kitty, right? You type in the words, it's a 3D asset, the texture is done, it's generated, right? And now all of a sudden you can have a one-man team, the graphic design team, for example, well, it's not a team, it's a one-man show that can do the same work that a team of 50 or 30 or 200 would usually do because the, the founder behind that team uh, behind that company used to run a, tra uh, a digital trading trading card company and they said for every card that they'd created i think they would spend three business days kind of like making it mm -hmm. right now they can pump out a, a card in like an hour right so all of a sudden they pretty much 30x the output and you don't need also all these steps of you know different people from different departments you know overlooking it and third one is also then going back to the NPCs um, is contextual content. So for example, quests. There was one startup we talked to that does AI generated quests, where again, you feed it, let's say the Game of Thrones lore and say, create in, like any, any NPC you talk to can give you a quest, you know, a task to do that is just created in the moment, right? And they have certain frameworks like, you know, you have to find an item, you have to craft something, you have to fight somebody, right? I mean, most things that there's maybe like 10 different things people do in games, right? And then you just add context to it, you make a different combination of them, and all of a sudden a game can be forever living and breathing and you actually never complete it, right? It becomes like the real world because in the real world there is no, the only end is when you die essentially, right? Like there's always new things to do, always new adventures to discover, always new worlds, you can always travel, well, now that's where this idea of the metaverse is no longer just a linear game, but rather it's a truly open world that real time evolves, real time changes. The people are also always changing. Not, it's not every time you talk to them, they say the same five words, right? And now it becomes, again, so much closer to that vision that, of what people see in the metaverse. And the, re, the only difference now is that it's not an, a vision, but rather the tools are getting built real time and they kind of already exist in, in a simple form. Um, so that's kind of the, 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 the AI angle um, and, and how it plays into the metaverse. In VR, AR, one of the biggest breakthroughs is probably uh, cloud rendering because, you know, you mentioned that you can only spend 40 minutes uh, in, in, in VR. Well, first of all, be getting sick, like there, there's this motion sickness is actually like how the games are developed. So one of our VR founders told us that there's small things that they have to, like that developers have to pay attention to. So for example, you should never be able to use a joystick to turn your head because the, the, your head is not used to that, right? Like if I'm looking forward, my vision should not start spinning, right? That's unnatural, right? So like there's certain motion controls that should not be allowed, that are allowed in normal 2D games that should not be allowed in VR. So for example, if you want to turn your head, you actually have to turn your head. Otherwise you'll start, you'll, you'll start spinning. Um, but, you know, the biggest complaint people have is the form factor, right? You've had these huge headsets, you've got tethered in, and if you're not tethered in, then probably the quality is really low because you can't, there's only so much processing power that you can pack. I mean, pretty much they have the computing power of a phone. That's essentially how they, they like Androids up there, right? And so the way around that, which, you know, one of our founders has been working on is cloud rendering, where the experience actually, you know, we're running the cloud, for example, with NVIDIA, 
um, that cloud running platform, you can exit from the Quest and you can play anything like super high fidelity, super high resolution, like Unreal Engine 5. And also when all the compute happens in the, in the cloud, you can make them even slimmer because then you don't need to lo uh, render locally anymore, right? So now you can have a super thin, like that's when we can get to the vision of the classes, so to say, right? We can have the actual classes um, and that Ready Player One quality experience. And when the, cl the classes are also much li they're lighter, they don't move around as much. And that's where the idea of, what is it? More natural. Yeah, it's more natural. And especially for, there's so many use cases beyond gaming, right? And th that's where I think VR gets interesting. I talked to the, 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 the head of the, the Quest store, right? So Oculus, they call Oculus Quest and they have the, the app store essentially, right? So the person that runs the store for, for Meta, Anand, um, he said their main focus right now is actually VR fitness, right? Because it's one killer use case right now where there's a huge audience of people that they don't want to go to the gym. Maybe they feel, they feel judged, they feel watched, or they don't want to buy equipment, they don't want to drive, they don't want to commute. They want to, from the comfort of the home, pop on a headset, right? And be able to do different workouts, whether that's, you know, a company called Supernatural that just got, that just got acquired by Meta for $500 million, where you can do like, for example, a boxing workout in virtual reality, right? Um, we looked at another company um, that does things like, for example, like virtual rowing, you know, but you're rowing, but in a beautiful immersive environment where there's always something to look at and, you know, um, little, little things to do. You can run, you can row and so forth. And the crazy thing is there's currently still very little money in VR, but that company, for example, already has, um, I think, like $150,000 per month, um, monthly recurring revenue. And the, the revenue is growing something like, you know, 30% month over month, because again, that's a very core use case where people are actually willing to pay, right? Kind of like back in the day with P90X, we had Insanity and those kind of like, you know, platforms where people like buy DVDs, put them in and pay for subscriptions. Now it's VR and also because it's so much more fun and so much more immersive where why, why does working out have to be pushing plates? Why does working out have to be like running on a treadmill when you could be in a gladiator arena or you could be a, a Jedi, you know, and like do really fun, cool things where you, you're dying to get back in there and do a workout, right? Because you said like you get tired too. Um, I said this to you, you know, um, one of the biggest uh, v uh, VR VCs, uh, Bitcraft, the founder is also German. And he said, you know, one of the tricky things with VR is that usually gaming is, there's a German term for who, you, only you're German, right? You're German? Austrian, right? So, so you, you, you get, yeah, yeah, but so, you know, he said. We did, we did a coalition where, you know, I didn't, we didn't realize that we're both German. Yeah. I don't know what so, 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 yeah. so he said in, in, in German, um, gaming is Spannung, aber auch Entspannung. So like it's a great wordplay. It pretty much, he said, um, it's uh, excitement, but also relaxation. Except in German, it's like the same word, except you add three letters, right? Mm -hmm. And so most traditional gamers, you know, it's, it's just like relaxed. Like you sit the bed down on the couch, you play. But in VR, I mean, it's a full on workout. Like you're like a Navy SEAL, you're running around, ducking, <laughs> jumping, right? And so that's not for everybody, of course, but that's where the fitness thing actually makes so much sense. Right, because now you can get a full workout and have an amazing time, and that's getting really pushed. And as the form factor gets smaller, it only makes it so much easier. Um, and then other things, you know, we're exploring, for example, like virtual events, so that for example, you can, you, you can attend a concert in virtual reality. And there's my, one of the, our founders that, that works on that told me it has a really great line that I love, and he says, "Reality is the new luxury," and it makes so much sense when you actually take the vantage point of the world versus our vantage point where, you know, if you live in a city like, you know, Miami, New York, LA, Hong Kong, right? There's plenty of things to do. There's, you know, there's always major festivals. There's, you know, nightlife and so forth. But in most places in the world, it is really, really boring. There aren't that many things, right? You, not everybody is going to go, going to go in their lifetime to Coachella because Coachella tickets are like, what, $600, $1,000. And then you fly in, you have to get a hotel. It's just not a reality for most people. But if all of a sudden you have these fully immersive virtual concerts, for example, where for micro payments you can attend and like then an artist can not just perform in front of a thousand people or 10,000 people, but can perform in front of five million people across thousands of shards, right? Um, that becomes scalable and then take it a step further. What if they don't even have to perform live? What if it's an AI rendition of them performing live around the clock 24 seven? And what if, they can perform posthumously, where you can still attend a Nirvana concert, where you can still attend, you know, um, uh, a Bob Marley concert and so forth, right? That too is becoming a reality um, with, you know, VR and AI intertwining.
So that was Laurent from Red Laurent, Red. Yeah. 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 Fantastic, yeah. So that's actually an evolution of ignorance is a bliss from. What do you mean? The, 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 oh, yeah, yeah. Like the evolution like for everyone. Right, where it's like the food or it's a... Uh, is a bliss, right? Right. I love that part, actually. And, yeah, and I mean, the dystopian view, like, I, I guess, mini background that I that kind of left out, too, is, like, I'm a dystopian fiction author, and so, like, I... <laughs> so, back in 2016, I published my first... I, hmm? It's dystopian... Dystopian fiction author, so, like, I... I've, I'm, I'm really weird where like even when I was young I, I imagined like how the world can end in, like, in bad ways <laughs> um, <laughs> and ideally Utopian versus dystopian. correct correct my mind just always jumps to the future and I see like how things go wrong now my mantra is and I think it's actually my phone background where I say um, you know uh, invest in the invest in the good and fight to prevent the bad right because the reality like, the, the current path that I think humanity is on and I've been I wrote this down like 2016 is Automation will take away most jobs. Once most jobs are automated, you got to have universal basic income from a pure political perspective because you don't want riots in the streets. They're gonna pay people for existing, essentially. Now, the problem is... So you're part of the singularity movement, for sure. Oh uh, yeah, I believe in transhumanism. Um, but the next step then is, well, if people don't have work, they're also gonna like meaning more than likely. So you gotta give them a way to find meaning, right? Then that's where the metaverse comes in. And you know, most people will probably live in virtual reality. That's gonna become the, the drug of choice, so to say. Um, but the core part here is that the, the metaverse should be decentralized because it gets very, very scary when like a centralized company owns it, right? So for example, with Meta, even though like uh, I'm, I'm friendly with them nowadays. Um, they, it is scary to think, for example, like with the Quest, they can actually track your pupils, they can track your eyes. So for example, they can see when do you dilate, when they, you know, where, what do you look at, right? What, what triggers you, right? Where does your attention go? It's so much further than just you scrolling through Instagram and where do you stop, right? Where then they can really, truly deeply understand you, combine it with the, the data they already have on you. And then, you know, if you walk down the street in Hong Kong, right, there's there's an ad, but we all see the same ad, right? In VR, we can be in the same virtual environment, except you now might see different things, right? I might have something on my shirt that I don't even know is on my shirt, but you might see it because, you know, there might be a small uh, advertisement, right? Or like the, the paintings might be different, right? So there's very subtle ways to like, again, influence people's beliefs. Um, but how do you get here? Yeah, I guess with the stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. That, that's where the decentralization is important, which I guess is a good, good, good segue to you know uh, the next part with Web three. I mean, I already covered the Web three angle pretty good with like DAOs and and DeFi and so forth. But I guess this highlights why it's so important, right? I think Web three gets a lot of um, what's the word gets judged a lot because the truth, you know. Fun. Yeah, but like over 70 years, people. Scary <laughs> spreading on. Yes. Yeah, but like, you know, over 70 years, people, the critics would say, like, what does crypto have to show? Right? Because it's not people will look around and say, well, it's not like we're using Bitcoin 24 7. It's not like the average person uses DeFi. NFTs that seemed like a hype. But the reality is, it's the underlying plumbing, the underlying infrastructure that is so, so important to make sure that we don't live in a meta, meaning a Facebook owned virtual world, right? Where, you know, Google and so forth, are, you know, because they also have so much data on us where one time in 2018, there, Google has a link where you can actually download all the data they have on you. And so I think when I downloaded the data that they have on me, because it's tied to your Google account, right? Um, it was about two terabyte. They have about two terabyte of data on me where they actually even captured like the metadata, for example, like what advertisements since inception of my Gmail account have I ever clicked on, right? They track all of that. And I guess because of privacy disclosures, they have to maintain it. And then you are actually able to download it, which is very interesting to see like how much they have on you. Um, and so that's where, you know, Web3 is- you run that through chat, you be <laughs> no, Well, no, but no, no it will, of course. And, and I think that's- Who am I? <laughs> Chat GPT and you get an answer. I would, you know, initially I was thinking it's like <laughs> Fang could so, like initially I was thinking, you know, because historically most big companies, if you, you can look at these graphs of how the top 10 companies by market cap and let's say 40 years ago are no longer the top 10 companies market cap today and like they change almost every three decades. It's like a changing of the guard, right? But with Fang, the more I think about it, it's, it's actually going to be really hard for them to be disrupted because they've built such a massive data moat now, which combined with AI, nobody can copy, right? So the most valuable asset essentially in, in, in the age of AI is actually data that is not publicly available because we can all have the same models, right? But, and because for example, ChatGPT taps into everything that's public until 2021. What it doesn't have is private data. 
So for example, like all the data that Meta has, only Meta's AI can use, right? All the data Google has, only Google's AI can use. And so they will be way more nuanced and specialized or same way, like, let's say I have data on my business that nobody else has. So like I can train my uh, language model locally to be specialized for my specific business, right? But so that data is a currency and okay, who is the most data? Probably Google, probably Meta, right? And then all, uh, what's called commercially, uh, like commerce wise, Amazon, of course, too, right? One of the biggest marketplaces. Um, and so that's where, you know, Web3 actually matters a lot. We might not see that much day to day yet, but you have to understand that, like it took so long to even build the rails. Like three years ago, you were not even able to do an on-chain swap, right? Like on-chain swaps, like DeFi is only really things that's a 2019, 2020. Um, Multi-chain being able to move money from one chain to another chain happened in 2021, the first bridges, right? It's only so recent. And so that's that's what Web3 plays in to actually make sure that, you know, it's not a dystopia, but actually hopefully maybe a utopia, right? Because there's also a lot of opportunity comes to the virtual world, which we can discuss in a second. And then the last part was, uh, well, the gaming fund, there's not much to, sh to but rather I can, I can show later. Um, I've said a lot, so maybe I'll just pause you for a second and I'll let you guys digest or ask questions. Oh, join me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we do have a little token of appreciation. No. Yes. All right. Uh, there's the